This program is brought to you by 3CTV. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up on the latest 3CTV programs. from UC um, Los Angeles and a master's degree in history from Chico State. And he's been teaching out here since the early 80s, maybe before some of you were born, I'm going to assume. We're, we're kind of getting up there, right? <laughs> uh, professor, uh, professor Harvest loves Mexico, loves it. In fact, he even spent a whole summer there, one time studying, a couple of summers, studying the history of Mexico. So what we're going to talk about, what he'll talk about with you tonight is uh, Mexico's Cristero War, which took place in 1926 to 1929, and it was the war between the Mexican government and the Catholic Church. So please help me welcome uh, Professor Jay Hargis. Before we get started, let me apologize that my voice is starting to go, so if I start, stop and look at something and start drinking, it's not, uh, it has nothing to do with you. But uh, before we get started, how many of you have heard of the Cristero War before? Okay. It's one of those things that has been forgotten, hence my interest in it. Uh, the Mexican government has gone out of its way to forget it. Uh, it's definitely remembered more by people than by institutions. And so many of the people, if you're here, if your ancestors came from Mexico, and many of the ones who are in this area came from Mutual Con, that was one of the key areas for the Cristeros. And so there's a there's a popular memory of people, including the immigrants who came here, but the government itself has gone out of the way to try to hide the particular war. And we'll take a look at why as we go through the presentation. So anyway, so I will give you now Mexico's Cristero War. What is it all about? Well, in the sense, it is um, occurred after the Mexican Revolution, which took place in 1910 to 1921. And the state suddenly found itself in the mid-20s confronted by the Catholic Church and the, uh, an armed uprising, which they really didn't know what was going on. It was a conflict, it was also called the Cristiada, uh, which is as it's known in Mexico, and of course it's known as the Cristero War from the phrase, Viva Cristo Rey, long live Christ the King. So there are elements of, the, of Catholic theology and practice that are involved with this, and of course then there's the Mexican government trying to keep control of the situation and uh, coming down hard on the church, and it appears to look like it is what we call anti-clericalism, which is uh, government attacking the church, attacking things like freedom of, of belief and so on. The Cristero War, uh, as you can see some of the results here, it, it came with the shooting of priests, the killing of believers, the closing of churches, and um, uh, worship restricted, and it allegedly ended in 1929, but it really didn't. And it kept was, went on for almost another decade. But uh, it is a story that's hard to hide because so many people were involved with. And in fact, it's actually a continuation of Mexico's revolution. But the revolutionary government doesn't want to acknowledge that. So that's the, essentially what happened. Now, again, why is this forgotten? Well, the government needed the revolution to be completed. We, we won. The revolution is over. So now we are changing Mexico for the better. And so anything in which the ordinary people were rising against the government didn't fit into that story very well. It was more about, you know, like maybe we didn't complete what we thought we completed. And uh, so th they, they tried to pass it off as a few uh, uh, foreign conservatives influenced by big corporations are, are resisting the changes that we, that we should have instituted to make Mexico a better country. But that's not what happened. It was the people, and the people rose up spontaneously even with the leaders of the church telling them not to do so, they still did it. And that's what makes it such an interesting process. Uh, it's not really covered in any official history. As I said, the government, of course, wrote all the books, for, just like they do here. Um, the teaching of history is to make you into a good citizen, and the Mexican government, in its plan to create good history and good patriotic Mexicans, didn't want this story to be told. 
So that's what makes it actually kind of interesting. The first historian who covered this, and he was surprised to find out that he was the first, was a French history uh, uh, researcher named Jean Meyer. He's still around. Recently written a new book that is uh, called The La Cristiada. It's a different one from the one you see here, but it's mainly pictures and published actually by the uh, Knights of Columbus, an American Catholic organization. So it's a little one-sided, but it's very interesting for all the stuff that it covers. So I have a copy up here if you want to take a look at it afterwards. Maybe we can persuade Lori to order one. So anyway, um, this is the why I got interested in. Here is just simply a wonderful old picture that shows the people doing what they wanted to do. Stand up for their faith. Um, doing what they felt that they needed to do. If it's not a stage picture, it's simply the people in action. And so there's a, there's a certain popular element about this with the people being involved that make this fascinating. Now the popular memory by most people though, gets a little distorted. It's all about persecution of the church, allegedly sen senseless murder of priests and the faithful, denial of religious liberties, how it's talked about in the United States. The government is atheistic, Masonic, socialist government, they're the ones who created everything. And then they created a film about this, which came out recently, called, in the United States, uh, For Greater Glory. Did any of you actually see that? I see a couple of heads nodding. It was shown to huge audiences in areas where Catholic churches brought all the faithful out to show it. And in Mexico, it was known as La Cristiada, and it, there was it sold out theaters wherever it was shown. So uh, it, you can get it on Amazon, it's like five bucks, but so you don't have to spend a lot of money. Uh, or you can see bits and pieces of it, of course, on YouTube. But it is available for you to watch. It definitely takes the Catholic point of view. And it simplifies things, which is what the popular memory reflects, a simplistic uh, interpretation of what happened, because it was personal for many people. It was not about, um, about, the, uh, about really big issues. It was about themselves. Uh, we see some of these parallels today, um, especially on talking about religious freedom. And here, this is a... Uh, uh, LBGT um, uh, person here says, stop squirming, you're, you're oppressing my, our religious freedom. Um, as oftentimes uh, religious groups don't like things, they perceive that as persecution. And in this case, that's how it was seen in Mexico. The heart of the conflict, though, is it's the Catholic Church versus the Mexican state. It was not a denial of the liberty of worship, but it was a reflection on history. And of course, this is the stuff that historians love to talk about, the context, the background, in this case, there's a long history of the Mex in Mexico of the Catholic Church being on the wrong side of just about every issue until fairly recent times. Mexico was, in, in, for instance, from independence to the Cristiada, they promoted and supported foreign invasions because they didn't like whoever was running Mexico. They urged the faithful, as it says, to oppose national laws in the Constitution and brand anybody they didn't like as a socialist, or at least a, a Mason. They didn't like the Masons because they were anti-Catholic. This book here is a wonderful uh, polemic in English that is just absolutely outrageous, but it's fun to read. The Catholic Church role in Mexican history, of course, goes back to the very beginning, at least with, with the, uh, the conquest and starting in 1519. Uh, they supported the conquest. They never apologized for the conquest, in which thousands upon thousands of native indigenous Mexicans died. Uh, including not just uh, uh, being killed in battle, but rape, pillage, and destruction other, other than that. They promoted conversions of the indigenous. Many were genuine, but a lot of them were forced. Uh, and in the story of the church in Mexico, only uh, Friar Bartolome de las Casas is remembered in a positive way. Because he's a conquistador who stood up against the other conquistadors, saying, no, we can't treat the indigenous people like that. They have a soul, too. But of course, he also advocated, let's bring in black slaves. So he's not a, a you know, clean hands on everything. The church was part of the Spanish colonial government for 300 years. They were partners. They were, it wasn't like it is here where we say that you know, separation of church and state and the church the, or the religious organization is it's something that you do personally. But in fact, in colonial Mexico, they could not conceive of a world in which the church was not part of. Coming from Spain, and Spain having fought for the Christian faith against the Moors for 700 years, they weren't gonna give up easily when they came here. Um, the Spanish government had the patronato, patronato Real, which was the right to appoint bishops here. So the government, of the colonial government had a very intimate relationship with the Catholic Church. Independence um, was a long struggle. It was initiated by a priest, uh, Father Hidalgo y Costilla, 
He was um, not a particularly good priest, but that doesn't make any difference. He was Mexico's uh, person who gave the Grito, which we just celebrated earlier this week, on the, the 16th of September, Mexican Independence Day. And um, the, the, the church, though, supported the colonial government that was totally against independence. Um, Father Hidalgo, when he was caught, as it says here, was turned over to the church, they excommunicated him, and then turned him over to the government who shot him, and then cut his head off. So, just to let him know. It's ironic that Mexican independence was actually achieved, again, with the, the Catholic Church in the background, when those who had fought against the, the, the people fighting for independence changed sides because Spain decided to in, implement a constitution that opened up freedom of worship. In other words, not, you didn't just have to be a Catholic. And so Mexico freaked out, conservatives in Mexico, and said, we need to be independent. And so those who supported the church actually brought independence, not the, the revolutionaries who would have started this. And that's the, the person who took over, um, Agustin de Iturbide, who became Mexico's first ruler, which was an emperor, not very democratic. And the church loved him. They still love him. The reform laws were... If me independent Mexico had to deal with the fact that after independence, I'm not going to read all of this, Mexico granted special privileges to the Catholic Church. For instance, if you were, uh, if you were Catholic, part of the Catholic hierarchy, the laws didn't apply to you. you. You stood outside the laws. And so if the government tried to do something to you, well, you had your own set of courts. Uh, you could kill, you could steal, you could do anything you want, but the government couldn't touch you. So Mexico's government, from the beginning, had a problem with the church. And also the army, by the way, also had the same privileges of being outside the law. These were called fueros. By the middle of the 1800s, though, Mexico's uh, leaders began to realize we could not have a, a sovereign country with these kinds of things existing. So the reform laws were to break the control of the Catholic Church. These controls, as you see up here, hit the church where it really didn't want to be hit. The church was the largest landowner in Mexico. Because when people died, they often granted land to the church so people would say prayers for them when they were in, and they would escape uh, uh, purgatory. And they also, uh, since they owned the most land, they also had the most money. And so they, they were the banks of Mexico. They were the real estate agents of Mexico. They never sold any church land, though. Once you give it to the church, it always belonged to the church. And um, they also were the most educated. All the universities are run by the church, so all the educated people are churchmen. So how can you have a government that is, that is a real government if the church runs everything? And so what they did is they began to restrict this. Um, especially, it says that they changed, uh, they, they, they cut down uh, um, any, all the church uh, immunities and privileges were, were turned away. The uh, corporations, meaning churches, were not allowed to own land that they weren't using. So you couldn't have a whole bunch of homes or haciendas or stuff like this in which nobody could use. And finally, they also then said that we're going to use a, the government is going to register births and deaths and, instead of the church doing that. Because the church charged for it. And ordinary Mexicans didn't have a lot of money. So because of this, though, Mexico, and it was put into the Constitution of 1857. This led to a war because the conservatives in the church were opposed to this. This was probably the worst of all the wars in Mexican history. Very little remembered about it, but it was bloody and horrible, called the War of the Reform. And in the end, when the conservatives lost, they then, in the, the church and the conservatives invited the French to come in. And if you know the story of Cinco de Mayo, that's when the French first came in 1862 to bail out the conservatives, but they were defeated, but came back a year later. And the city, all, all Mexican churches welcomed the French as liberators. Uh, and because they're gonna save them from those evil liberals. And so they also uh, supported the imposition of the emperor Maximilian who the French brought in to run Mexico. Uh, eventually, though, the Mexicans under Benito Juarez, who's the face that's second to the left, would throw them out, and they would win. And so the, the, the anti-church provisions of the reform became part of the Mexican Constitution. Now, you'd think that things would change overnight, but they didn't. There's often people saying things about something, but actually doing them as a, a Mexican tradition, at least in Mexican government. It's like, I'm going to fix everything, but we won't do it today. Uh, and so the provisions of the Constitution were not directly implemented. And so that meant that the church felt that it could still get away with a lot of these things. And it continued to run in education especially. Finally, the Mexican Revolution. Again, way too wordy here. I'm very sorry about that. Um, originally just to overthrow the, a dictator who was in power for many years. And, but what it, what it did was it opened up people's demands for real change. 
And Mexico, in fact, became the only country in Latin America that had um, issues that, of, of demands by, by peasants and by poor people and by workers. They had workers' rights before we did, union rights before we did officially as part of their constitution. So for 11 years, they had a struggle that started out a deposing a dictator, then became a bloody civil war, and it raised these, these rather, um, uh, what would be the best word would be the, these rather um, uh, revolutionary issues of changing society, of redistributing land, of taking uh, the power of foreign corporations like American corporations who ran their oil business away and gave give it to Mexico. Of course, all of these were problematic. It's good to ask for them. It's really hard to put them into effect. So they also came up with a couple of things related to the church. And um, let's, we'll get to that here. The winner of the, of the revolution was uh, Alvaro Obregón. And he was uh, Norteño. He was from Sonora, Sonorense. The, the Sonorans were the ones who won. And a number of the, the next couple leaders will all be from Sonora. And, the, the, and, and those of you who have lived in or been in Mexico, you know where Sonora is. It's right up along the US border, south of California, and especially Arizona. And the thing about Sonora is it's very different from the rest of Mexico, just like Baja California is actually very different from the rest of Mexico. Central Mexico, village communities, uh, churches, priests, agricultural. Sonora is way up in the north. There's ranching. There's a lot of business related to the United States. There's very little traditional village communities up there. And so the church was not that important. They had very few priests in Sonora. So the Sonorans, as winning the revolution, were not dedicated to replacing the church back into power or ignoring the things that had been negotiated during the revolution. So in their constitution that was written during the revolution, the 1917 constitution, which is still in place today, these are the things that it says. Education is to be secular. Even in private schools, it's to be secular. Um, the church cannot own any property, including the buildings of the church. They all belong to the state. Uh, it was amended, of course, to, uh, in 1934 to promote socialist education and to get rid of the, um, the, what they called fanatical beliefs. Uh, later on in the 1950s and then the 1980s, that was actually amended out of the Constitution. So it doesn't have that there now. Article 130, though, is the one that really hit the church. As a church, it has no legal status. States can limit the number of priests in one state for the thousands and thousands of people that they had, they only had one. They decided to cut all them down to one priest so they could control them. Uh, no foreign clergy, uh, no worship outside of church buildings. Priests have no right of free speech to vote, no right of association, and they cannot criticize the government. Why did they do this? Because of Mexico's history. Because the church had resisted na nation building for so long. And so the government, to, to establish its revolutionary <laughs> credentials, and to, to put its processes and its beliefs into practice, they had to cut the church out from undercutting them yet again. So it's, to us, it's ridiculously severe. But to the revolutionaries, this, was a, this made sense. It was in line with the things that had been done in the 1857 Constitution. Of course, this is the purpose of education, to teach each little Mexican child to, be a, to wave its Mexican flag, to march behind the banner of Father Hidalgo, <coughs> not the banner of the Virgin of Guadalupe, because that would, be, again, be a counter-national um, symbol, although it's the most important national symbol, uh, because that was the very first one that they used when they started Mexican independence. The, the Virgin is not just a religious figure. She represents <laughs> the spirit of Mexican independence. But the government was trying to fight all of this. Now, Cristo Rey, Christ the King. Um, it promoted the loyalty of the Catholics to the church and, and to God rather than to secular governments. How did this come about? It came about again in the 20s. Uh, there was a, a movement afoot, not just in Mexico, but all over the Catholic world. And the uh, apostolic delegate, the delegate from the Vatican, was in Mexico in 1923. And, and they dedicated this monument on top of a mountain in Guanajuato State, right about the center of the country, a gigantic statue of Christ. Now, what's the harm in that? Except that to a new government that was still a little shaky, this was like they were undercutting their, the loyalty of their own citizens. You should be loyal to the state, to the government, to the country. You know, you shouldn't give up on this. The Catholic Church, by the way, was also going through what's known as the Roman question at this time, which is who controlled Rome, the Pope or the Italian government? 
And so this Cristero Rey movement was a way to undercut not only Mexican but Italian nationalism and a number in Spanish nationalism during the Spanish Civil War and a number of other things where the church was trying to emphasize its its role in this. Because to be Catholic meant you weren't just something that somebody did on Sunday. It was an every single day kind of commitment in your life. And so Pope Pius uh, put it out, as it says here, Pope Pius the, the 11th, and uh, to, it seemed to be a, a resistance to the revolutionary government. That's how they saw it. During the uh, Cristero War, the government actually bombed the monument and blew it up. But a new one has been built, and it looks like this. And it is on top of a mountain. So it, it would be like if we had a mountain in the middle of the valley, and it can be seen for hundreds of miles, or practically, or at least 50 or 60 miles, because it stands so high and can't be missed. Again, more or less in the center of the country. But the fact that the government has allowed it to be rebuilt, rebuilt suggests that they finally came to grips with all of this. It's not worth kicking against the goat or kicking against somebody for a long time. Oh, now, let's, how did the Cristero movement actually get started? Well, the conflict between the church and the state was bubbling for many years. President Obregón, the first president after the revolution, chose not to enforce the Constitution against the, the Catholic Church. Why? Because he was already was up to his eyeballs in other problems, and the most important one being the relationship with the United States. No Mexican government worth its salt can ignore the United States. We can ignore Mexico, but they, don't, they can't ignore us, unfortunately, because we're sitting, we're st standing on occupied territory. This was Mexico, if you remember. So the United States scared the living daylights out of them, and for good reason. But what happened was that it was all about oil. The, the uh, Constitution said the, the resources under the underground belong to the Mexican people. They don't belong to foreigners. And, and we're going to kick the foreigners out. And the US government said, you know, you know how it works. American businessmen complain to the government and say, they're a bunch of communists. They're trying to take our, our uh, property in Mexico. And we want Mexicans to just ignore us and let us do what we want to and pay them less and pay our guys more. So on, which is what happened. And um, so Obregón spent most of his time negotiating with the United States and finally got what's called the Bucarelli Accords in 1923, which basically said we're not going to enforce it, the, the provisions of the Constitution for 25 years. And so the US was happy. And so then they, they, they recognized his government. And because of this recognition and these accords, throughout the Cristero War, the US government sold arms to the Mexican government. Even though many Americans, especially Catholic Americans, protested against this, the US government said, you know, we have an agreement with these guys. We don't really like them all that much, but you know, they cut a deal with us and they supported our, they basically are doing what we want them to do. So we're gonna, they're the government we're gonna support. And so many a Mexican died, again, from US ammunition. It's sort of ironic, of course, that that's going on now, too. This time it's the drug thing, and US Amer Americans are using the drugs, buying them from Mexico and then selling guns to Mexicans to kill each other over the, you know, the importation of drugs. So it's ironic. Now, newspapers. Sometimes newspapers do good things, sometimes bad. And the El Universal here printed a nine-year-old article that was in an interview that was uh, had taken during the revolution. And they decided to print it at this time with the archbishop saying basically to that the, the Mexican constitution is evil and you can't be a good Catholic and support it, blah, blah, blah. He condemned it totally. And so at this moment, with the, with the stress already on how are we going to deal with this and this new revolutionary government that's only been in place for a couple of years, to them it appeared to be like he had just given this, just right now. And so the government, under the new president, were, was decided to go after this. This is an act of rebellion. And here's the new president. Kind of an interesting character. Never Doesn't get a good press because of the Cristero War. Ended up his life getting, well, he ended up eventually getting kicked out of Mexico while he was reading a copy of uh, Mein Kampf, apparently, uh, when the soldiers came in to kick him out later on. But, um, and he wound up in California, by the way. He, he got a nice little house down in San Diego and spent the rest of his life down there. Um, Plutarco Calles, he's one of the Sonorenses, one of the Sonorans. Uh, basically grew up anti-Catholic, didn't see the reason for the church in any particular reason. He had been, was involved in the revolution, and he was angry at the church's attack at the Constitution while he was trying to enforce it. And so he came up with a, a way to kind of stick it in their eye, and that was called the Caius Law, which was named after him, which was to put the, the articles of the Constitution into effect. 
with these additions, churches and religious groups must register with the state. Priest ministers cannot hold public office, campaign, or campaign on the behalf of political parties or candidates, and they cannot inherit property. In other words, they have no rights whatsoever. But remember, the church had been an opponent of the government, and so they were simply trying to prevent the church from influencing opponents of the government, among other things. But he also didn't like the church and just hoped it would go away. Uh, and this is, of course, how popularly they were seen. Christ being tied down by Caius there with the, with the whip. And Obregón is over the Christ's left shoulder. And the guy who runs the labor unions is on the left-hand side over there. So th this is, again, a popular kind of thing that would have appeared in a newspaper. Because the, the church said, well, it's, this isn't against the church. This is against Christ. <clears throat> so um, one of the first things that, that church groups did, and there were a couple of important groups, there was the League uh, here, the National League for the Defense of Religious Liberty, and then there was the uh, youth movement. They decided the first step would be to boycott. Uh, put a boycott, stop spending money, make the government back off. Don't be violent. Because the bishops were saying, don't be violent. The Pope was saying, don't be violent. Although they were condemning, the Pope was specifically condemned the Mexican government in one of his encyclicals. So they decided to protest this. So the boycott was only marginally effective, and, but all it did was agitate the government even further. The response to this, so the clergy worked out, how are we going to get the government to do what we want to do? And so they said, I know, we'll just basically uh, put a boycott on of church practices. We won't do any births or deaths or, or uh, masses. Uh, we won't you know, give anybody uh, church burials, and we'll force the government to back off. Now in the movie, uh, for greater glory, it, it insinuates that the government shut the churches down. But no, the church shuts, shut itself down as a way to force the government uh, to give up its, its persecution. Because it was persecuting the church, but the church decided to stop all kinds of services and stuff. And since once the church shut down, uh, the, the, gov the, the government basically said, fine, we're taking over the building. And so they moved in. And that caused some of the first conflict. You can see here that people were rushing to, before the, the, everything closed to get in some of the last official services because they, you know, it was so important to their life and to their understanding of how or where, their, where their place is in the world that people would stand for hours to be able to go into these. Um, and again, here's at, at this point, then doing masses without the priest, which I don't know how you do that. Uh, finally, the last little. Uh, uh, nail in the coffin here was by this guy, Luis Morones, who was your typical, I guess, sort of almost atypical uh, labor, corrupt labor boss. The, the Mexican government created a single labor union um, to incorporate all unions within the revolutionary movement. And the unions had been, been incorporated by the winners, actually, in the process, had been recognized, as I said, before the U.S. recognized unions. And, but he was given this big job, and he was a very ambitious politician, and so he was opposed to the Catholic Church, which was running its own labor organizations. And so he was fighting against them, tried to get back at them in 1925 by starting a Mexican national church. He, a number of his followers and a number of priests burst into a church that in Mexico City and tried to take it over for themselves. And of course, so it just shocked the parishioners and it shocked the priests and the Catholic hierarchy. And uh, he thought that would force them to back off, but it didn't work. It just made people more resistant to the government. It appeared to be yet another attempt by the government to uh, train, you know, basically uh, attack the church. Um, the first big shootout occurred not, not uh, too long after the churches were shut down. The Caes Law were, were put into effect, which was on the 1st of July, um, or the 31st of July, uh, 1926. Um, 400 armed Catholics, again, without the permission of the church, or they simply got into it, one of the Guadalajara churches. Guadalajara is the second largest city, and they had a shootout. Uh, which 18 people died. And this was the beginning of the revolt, although there had been a number of small things before this. This brings us to the question, is why would people be willing to die for this? For a Catholic clergy that basically was telling them not to do it. And again, it's very complex. It's, it's simple to say they're just a bunch of you know, people. You could say, as the, the Mexican government said, they're just a bunch of deluded people who are being led astray by priests. Uh, but religion... They felt that, the, that religion was at, was at risk, that their identity, who they were, what they believed in, the communities that they grew up in. Um, they were, to them again, it's not an optional thing. It was the world that they lived in. Uh, Mexican Catholics, um, 
were often criticized by bishops by their not being really traditional Catholics. They had too many folk beliefs that had worked their way into the system. But they said that they couldn't imagine their life. If the churches are shut down, it doesn't matter if the priests have ordered or the bishops have ordered the church is shut down, they blame the government. I, they're saying, you know, you can't go to mass. You, you're, you can't get your daughter married. You can't, if you die, you took, you're like a dog, a dead dog in the street, one person said. I want to, I want to be buried in a traditional, you know, with the, with the full ceremony. And again, it's, it's not something that is unusual. This was their way of life. And, and the descendants of the Spaniards and descendants of the, of the indigenous, they, they had hundreds of years of this, uh, thousands of years that their ancestors were Spanish, which many were. So literally the government's fault for everything. And so they simply said, we're gonna fight. You know, we're fighting for God. We're not fighting for the church, we're fighting for God. And so for the ordinary people, this was a matter of faith and commitment and so on. Doesn't really fit in the 20th century idea of what a revolution is supposed to be about, which is about revolutionary change or new ideas and stuff like this. It was very much for old ideas, for traditional faith, for the world that they, they lived in. And they could not imagine it any different. Their cry, Viva Cristo Rey, long live Christ the King, basically saying he's the one we're going to obey, not the government. So, uh, hence they were called Cristeros. And there were about 50,000 or so on and off. Some of the priests were involved, and a couple of the priests actually were out there shooting people. And one famous guy, Father Vega, actually, uh, uh, when his brother was killed in an attack on a train, poured gasoline all over the train and burned everybody up inside of it. Uh, he's in the movie, but he, you see him in the movie saying, well, what, can we get all the people out first? He wouldn't have said that, because that's not the kind of guy he was. But it makes, you know, they're trying, remember this is a movie that's trying to make them out to be the good guys. So but Father Vega, I don't know, you'll have to think of that one for yourself. Um, you could see here, in a sense, this flag is a statement that the Virgin of Guadalupe is over the national symbol. The three colors, the original Mexican independence, the flag actually has meaning. How many of you knew that? The colors stand for something. Yeah, I like a couple of you know that. The white stands for the purity of the Catholic Church. When they originally fought for independence, that's when they came up with the army of the three guarantees and the flag of the three guarantees. Guarantee number one was the purity of the Catholic Church. They, so Mexican national identity is so tied up with the church that it was hard to break it, even by the government. Here's where most of the fighting took place. You can see Sonora is up in the northwest corner there, Guaymas, Hermosillo, and so on. And so um, those guys are a long way away from where all the fighting takes place. The central part of Mexico, the Indian part of Mexico, the village part of Mexico, the traditional areas in the center. And um, so it, it, was a, it, was a pretty, it was a pretty substantial numbers of people. Uh, here, and, and, and I've had to cut a lot out because I don't want us to be here for hours and hours and hours. But, so I've just mainly got a few uh, pictures here for you to get some, a sense of some of the things. Men, women, and children were involved. Um, the people who were involved in this felt that they were doing a great sacramental duty, that, that what they were doing was akin to going to church and, and praying and, and, and confessing and so on. And they were willing to wouldn't lay their lives down for this. Um, in the movie, of course, they emphasize old Victoriano Ramirez on the right, known as El Catorce, because he killed 14 people just what, at one time when they sent them to kill him. And that one of the corridos that I played before the presentation was the corrido of El, El Catorce. So but those, are, those corridos are online. Just look up corridos or ballads of the, of the Cristero War, I think you want to hear them again. But again, they, uh, they organize themselves. This is at a, uh, a mass when the Cristeros are coming and getting blessed, uh, sometimes by priests, sometimes by, uh, by others. If the priests were involved, the government considered them to be traitors. And so they, when they struck back, they often struck back at priests who were not doing the things that they said that they, did, they were doing. They were inside the buildings when the buildings had been closed. They were wearing their robes. They weren't supposed to wear their robes in, in public because that would, again, they would say that you're trying to influence people. Uh, if they were, they were found with weapons, and some of the priests smuggled weapons and so on to some of the groups. Uh, if they were with the soldiers when they were, were captured or with the Cristeros, they were, they were considered to be uh, dangerous. Children, as well, played a major role in this. Um, 
and, and you know, again, it's just simple faith, people standing up for what they believed in. Also women. A lot of this move, the, the Cristero movement could not have happened without women. They set up a Joan of Arc, Joan of Arc brigades. Why Joan of Arc? She's a Catholic saint. In the 1920s, she had just gained her sainthood from the Catholic Church, and she had fought against the English, so she was a national hero. So you could fight against somebody and kill them and still be a saint. So that's a pretty good deal. So, but anyway, the Joan of Arc brigades, uh, women uh, passed ammunition to the Cristeros. They carried them. It's shown, by the way, that's shown in the movie if you want to see that. And they uh, they uh, brought weapons and so on, and um, prepared gunpowder and did all kinds of things in support of the program. Father Pro. Now, Father Pro is probably the most famous priest who was killed during the Cristero War. Today, he's blessed Father Pro and known all over the world. And uh, certainly, he's on his way to sainthood. Um, the, a number of the, the, the priests were, uh, 25 of them have already made saints, and the rest are on their way. Uh, and he was beatified, I believe, by um, uh, Pope Benedict. So it's fairly recent. Um, Father Pro was, when the church, when the government shut down church services, Father Pro would put on disguises and go from place to place. He'd ride his little bicycle all around Mexico City, and he would go from place to place and do services for people inside of homes. And um, the government knew about him, but he was more annoying than anything else. But what happened was that um, as uh, the President Caius's term, which was 1925 to 1928, as he as his term was ending, President, uh, former President Obregón was going to run again. And so somebody tried to kill him. And one of the people who drove the car was one of Father Pro's brothers. And so here we have people who were involved in an assassination attempt of a Mexican revolutionary hero. And the government could not believe that Father Pro was not behind it. So they basically, without trial, they just lined him up and he he uh, prayed, and uh, they actually marched him down the street. Uh, he, he prayed for everybody. He uh, refused the blindfold. Of course, he had this rather Christ-like like execution pose, and they shot him, and then they shot him in the head. And they, the government distributed the pictures thinking that it would um, scare the priests and other Catholics into not doing this. And instead, it simply made him probably the most famous martyr, even more than any martyr in the Mexican Revolution. And he's He's, he's really at the wrong place at the wrong time, and, but he stood up for his faith. He died a good, di a good death, if there is such a thing. And uh, of course, he's remembered today. All it did, of course, was make more people join and say willing to do the same kind of, uh, of uh, sacrifice <coughs> for their faith. Now, President-elect Obregón, he did get elected, by the way, and he did get assassinated just before he was to take office. He, here it shows him at dinner uh, in a little restaurant called La Bombilla in uh, the southern part of Mexico City, and this guy named Jose uh, Toral, uh, uh, Jose de Leon Toral, which is the guy in the lower right-hand corner with the hat. Uh, he was a sketch artist and walked up to him and offered, he was sketching people at the dinner, politicians, and walked up to Obregón and asked if he could sketch him. He said, sure, and he pulled out a gun and shot him in the head. Uh, he was an ultra-Catholic, and the government tried to get him to confess, uh, you know, torturing him, and he refused to say anything. Finally, he said, that he wanted to see Madre Conchita, this nun. And he went to see her and basically said, um, um, will you stand with me in my martyrdom? And she said, sure. And so that's her all dressed up. It's not very nun-like, but that's her with the stole and the little um, the little uh, 1920 style cloche hat that they had there. And um, they went to trial. Uh, they were both convicted. Uh, he got the death penalty. She got 25 years on the East Las Marias, which is a kind of a Devil's Island for Mexico. And eventually she was, after about 10 years, she was um, pardoned. She probably had nothing to do with it, but he was associated with her. He came to her prayer meetings. She was going to stand up with him, again, to make a statement a la Father Pro, but, but she was not guilty, apparently, of any of this, so far as we know. Uh, we have here a, a, a command. This uh, Santos del Dolado was a commander in the in Michu Western Michoacan, southern Jalisco area. Um, so many, may, perhaps of your ancestors came from Michoacan, they might have known him. Uh, many of the Cristero uh, leaders wore large crosses, again, and to identify them as to who they were. Um, the, 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 the highest general in the Cristero movement was not even a believer. 
This was uh, General Enrique Goros Dieta, and he was had been a conservative uh, person who had fought against the revolution. He one of the youngest generals in the Mexican army. They had lost. He had gone home, got involved in a soap business, in a soap factory of some kind as an investment, decided that was too boring, and so the Catholic League hired him to be the commander of the, the, the Cristero army, and he said, fine, give me 25,000, which was more than anybody else in the Mexican army made at the time. And uh, he might have, had they won, he might have become president of Mexico, because he organized them and they began to win a lot of battles against the national government. Again, just Chris Darrow's. This is a famous picture that was on the Portable College webpage. This again was a priest who refused to come out of the church, still wearing his vestments, when the government took over the building, and so they just shot him. And again, making more people stand up for the church in the process. They didn't realize that. The government, much like uh, governments throughout Latin America in more recent times, did a lot of sort of terror tactics, and they went after people, and here you see cutting people's heads off, and hanging Cristeros or Cristero supporters from a nearby tree. Uh, there were a lot of them that were hung along uh, uh, railroad tracks. Uh, the movie does tell the story of uh, the blessed uh, Jose Luis Sanchez del Rio. How many of you have heard of, of him before? A couple of people? Okay, that's his shrine there on the right. He was a young man who was like a, wanted to be an altar boy, and had uh, but had joined the Cristero movement. He was a flag carrier for General Godos Dieta. Lent, he lent a, another general a horse, and when their area was overrun, he continued firing at the federal soldiers uh, until he was captured. Then, they, since the federal soldiers were mad that this boy had been shooting at them, and they, you know, they, they had lost a few people, they decided to torture him. And so, uh, after you know, he had had a couple days in prison, uh, jail, with the uh, praying, you know, that he was wanting to be a martyr, just like Father Pro. But they apparently cut the. The, his, the, the bottom of his feet off and forced him to walk to a local cemetery and they were trying to get him to, to deny uh, Christ, basically to say, you know, deny it, deny it. He just kept saying, Viva Cristo, Cristo Rey. And so they basically uh, attacked him with machetes and killed him and bayoneted him to death. He's only 14 years old. But he's now considered a saint. So he's definitely on the way. And there you can see people that left things that they the sign of him showing him lying there, um, basically suffering again from the faith. Uh, many of the martyrs, if, if you were Mexican, you would know the names of these. And, uh, there, many of their faces now appear on all kinds of candles and so on like that as well. So again, here's some of the um, Cristeros being hung from telephone poles as a way to let people know. Uh, this is in Jalisco, which is near Guadalajara. Uh, this is a, a, a folk retablo that shows, again, the government, what it would do, it would come in and just shoot the, the, uh, the people if they felt that they were disloyal or they had been, in some way, supporting the Cristero movement. This is called also an es voto, which they often talk about miracles and stuff on these. Now, what about the United States? Well, this is US Ambassador Dwight Morrow. And Dwight Morrow is mostly known as the father-in-law of Charles Lindbergh, because his daughter, Lindbergh, came down to Mexico on a good world tour while he was down there, met uh, his daughter Anne, and married her. And uh, of course, then they, they had their baby kidnapped later on in the horror story, so uh, called the, the Lindbergh baby kidnapping in the 30s. But he was probably the, one of the best American ambassadors in Mexico. Most ambassadors had had a rather bad experience exploiting the Mexican government. Uh, or fighting against Mexican nationality, but Morrow came down again to try to end the revolt because the U.S. does not like disorder on the border. If you want to say it that way, they don't. They like to have want to make the world safe for American business, and the businesses they were concerned about were the oil companies again. The oil companies, by the way, were actually funding the part of the Cristero revolt because again, as long as the government's busy with Cristeros, they're not dealing with the oil companies and the things that they were continuing to do. Um, but Morrow came in. And, and Morrow th worked throughout the entire period with presidents, U.S. presidents. He met first with President Coolidge and then President Hoover. Uh, he also met with President Calle and, and, and had a meeting in the morning with, with uh, that President-elect Obergon before he was killed and knew that they were going to be able to resolve this. And he, he met with the Pope, uh, with, with representatives from the Pope and so on. And he eventually got everybody to agree to just, can we just turn down the notch a little bit? And so that led to what are what's known as the arrangements in Spanish, oh, and also the fact that President Calles, who was the most anti-clerical person 
was gone. They'd had an election. Obregón had won. Obregón was dead. Now what do you do? Well, Calles could have stayed in power, but he decided not to do that. He appointed a number of people who had no political power, like this guy, Emilio um, Portisquil. And Portisquil was, was not Calles, so the church would deal with him. They didn't want to deal with President Calles. But Calles stayed behind the scenes for the next four years, uh, uh, six years actually, manipulating all the, there were three interim presidents, and he manipulated all of them. But Portisquil was part of the reason why they came to an agreement in 1929 to end it. Here's Gorostieta. Oh, this is going on. General Gorostieta and a number, this was uh, right before the arrangements were made. Um, the government found out where he was and basically assassinated him. So. The uh, Los Arreglos, 1929, the arrangements. The Cristeros were to lay down their arms. The churches were to reopen. Officially, the conflict, the conflict was over. There was an amnesty promise. But in a very short time, 500 leaders were rounded up by the government and shot and over 5,000 Cristeros were executed after the official peace. This would, in fact, lead to a second uh, Cristiado or war in the mid-30s, 1934 to 1938. But again, and, and the many Cristeros felt that the bishops and so on that you see here betrayed them by, by agreeing to this. And, and even the Pope basically said, no more conflict, doesn't matter what they're doing, just get it over with. And so the Cristero movement kind of ends on and a kind of a soft bump, but the, the Cristeros themselves um, paid a price for it. Approximately 90,000 casualties, um, 30, 50, and this is what always amazes me, almost twice the number of government casualties as Cristeros. Probably because we don't really know how many Cristeros were involved exactly, and we, the government wasn't going to tell when they tortured people and killed people as well. So we don't know how many really died. Uh, a lot of civilians died. Oh, we know 40 priests were killed officially. The church did retain its buildings, and the priests were allowed to see them. The Caius Law stayed on the books, officially, with all of its restrictions about the priests and the church. Not changed until, uh, the Constitution was not changed, as I said, until 1992. And the conflict lingered, and literally more and more, and the, uh, the church itself, of uh, rural Catholics, decided to attack the government by killing teachers. Because the teachers were the local representatives of the government. And they would often go into some of the villages in Michoacan or Jalisco or so on, and they would cut their ears off. You don't hear, you're not hearing us. We don't want you here. We want a church education. We don't want a secular education. Especially in the 30s, the, under President Cardenas, uh, who was much more of a socialist than Caius was, they were actually promoting socialist education. And although Cardenas got along with the, the bishops, and so they never did anything officially. But again, the flag, demonstrating again that the primary loyalty is to the Virgin of Guadalupe, not to the government of Mexico. Any questions? Yes? Does the Mexican flag have meaning? Well, the Mexican, the Mexican flag re reflects what's called the Three Guarantees, which was in 1820, 18, uh, when the conservatives switched sides and joined up with the last few insurgents who were still fighting. And they said the three, the three guarantees were the purity of the Catholic Church is the white, the green is for revolution, for change, and the red was for all of the castes, all of Mexicans being equal. At least that's what it was for originally. They later changed that. All the, all the people of Mexico being equal. It doesn't matter what their background. So the, the eagle was added later. The eagle was not part of the original one. And in fact, the very first flag, the colors were that diagonal. They were not straight up and down like this. So other questions? Yes. What was, the, uh, <clears throat> what was the name of the ruler for the church in the beginning that you said I didn't catch his name? The, in the beginning of what? Um, it was like the when the, the pope? church was part of the, yeah when the church. Oh, it was Pope Pius the the eleventh, I believe, at the time. The, 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 the church was going through a difficult time in with relationship to new governments, especially governments that were not subservient to the church. So sometimes I have to say the church sometimes was its own worst enemy. But when I mean the church, I mean the organization. I don't mean the believers. The believers were interested in just believing. They were interested in their, their daily lives and their families and their concerns and, and uh, the things that they had always grown up with. They, they weren't out for major change. They just wanted things to be better. Many of the, some of the, the people who revolted also were uh, people who owned land and didn't like the idea of the government confiscating land and then giving it to the peasants, which was one of the uh, things that were in the Constitution or part of the revolutionary program. 
So, anybody? I'm, just, I'm curious. Does anybody have any? Some of your ancestors who might have been uh, Cristeros and the stories were passed down in the family. Yeah, there's one, two, very cool, three, four. So that you know, those kinds of things. If you can keep the get the stories from the family members, those are the kinds of things that you want to. If they're still around, talk to them at least find out what happened. Uh, oral history is somehow the only way we can get this information. Is you going and asking your aunt, your relatives, your older relatives to tell the story so that you can tell it to your kids as well. So that's pretty cool. Yes. Well, did you see the map where it was? It was mainly the central part. So Zacatecas, Durango, uh, Michoacan, Jalisco, Guanajuato, uh, Querétaro. For those of you who know these areas, the rest of it's just they're just names, of course. But uh, uh, Puebla, very religious in Puebla, of course. So Mexico City, uh, Morelos, the area Zapata was from. I've got Zapata on my thing here. He, uh, he, although he was a peasant, wanted land, he was still a, a very much a believer and uh, wanted the church to be involved in the revolutionary movement, so. But generally central Mexico, in a way, you know, not the parts that, that, are, that touch the United States, which would have been a slightly different country. Very, very different, in fact. Deserts instead of fields and fields of corn, valley, rich valleys, and so on. Any questions? Yes? Uh, yeah, besides the obvious reason that, that you know, there's conflict and all the negativity, in your opinion, what, what's the, why is it it's so hard to find Well, yeah, it doesn't, it's not the story the government wants told. The government's story is the revolution occurred, we threw out the old bad guys, and so we are the new good guys. And so the, if you tell the story of the Cristero War, that means maybe we're not the good guys. You're admitting that you didn't get it right the first time. And so quite literally, I mean, when I studied about the Mexican Revolution, it, it, at, it, uh, in school, I didn't, there, there was hardly anything that, was at, that were in the books. And um, it just was, and then it went, when I did find it, it just mentioned, oh yeah, but there was a Cristero conflict with the church and it you know, lasted three years, and that's about all it said. There was none of these personal stories. And so when I was in graduate school, it was just about the time this book was, was coming out. And it was still a brand new uh, topic. And I actually went down and got a chance to meet with, uh, with pro uh, Professor Jean Meyer. He was at UCLA a couple of years ago, so I went down to hear him. And he's actually become a practicing Catholic because of this. He, he originally approached this as a, uh, as a Marxist historian. In other words, everything is determined by class and, and all of this stuff. And he's actually been influenced by, by, by interviewing all the remaining uh, Cristeros and, and basically being amazed at their simple faith and what they were willing to do for that faith. And that actually transformed it. So it, the story is transformative. It can be, just like any good story is. Uh, we have time for one more question, yes. Can you tell me the name of the movie you said that was based on this the, book? In the United States and on Amazon, it's called For Greater Glory. And um, in, in Mexico, when, where it was first released, it's called, it's an, it's an English movie. And all the Mexican guys speak, and actually they have Ruben Blades as President Calles. That's a little bit weird for me, but, you know, so. <laughs> get a Puerto Rican to play a Mexican. Come on, there's got to be enough Mexican actors. <laughs> they can do stuff like that. But it's, it, it's called Cristiada is the Spanish version. And it's very popular. And if you go to some place like Sanborns or something, or you can order from Sanborns online, you probably can get a Spanish version of the, of the movie. So, for greater glory, though, yes. It's a good story. And, but at least it tells a story, even if it's not the totally accurate story. It's still pretty good. All right, well, I want to thank you for coming tonight, and uh, my voice managed to survive. So. <laughs>